I went into one of the largest men's clothing stores in New York City a few years ago and asked for a suit, describing exactly what was wanted but not mentioning price. The young man, who purported to be a salesman, said he did not believe they carried such a suit, but I happened to see exactly what I wanted hanging on a model and called his attention to the suit. He then made a hit with me by saying, Oh, that went over there? That's a high-priced suit. His reply amused me. It also angered me, so I inquired of the young man what he saw about me which indicated that I did not come in to purchase a high-priced suit. With embarrassment he tried to explain, but his explanations were as bad as the original offense, and I started toward the door, muttering something to myself about dumbbells. Before I reached the door I was met by another salesman who had sensed by the way I walked and the expression on my face that I was none too well pleased. With tact well worth remembering, this salesman engaged me in conversation while I unburdened my woes, and then managed to get me to go back with him and look at the suit. Before I left the store I purchased the suit I came in to look at, and two others which I had not intended purchasing. That was the difference between a salesman and one who drove customers away. Moreover, I later introduced two of my friends to the same salesman, and he made sizable sales to each of them. I was once walking down Michigan Boulevard in Chicago when my eye was attracted to a beautiful gray suit in the window of a men's store. I had no notion of buying the suit, but I was curious to know the price. So I opened the door and, without entering, merely pushed my head inside and asked the first man I saw how much the suit in the window was. Then followed one of the cleverest bits of sales maneuvering I have ever observed. The salesman knew he could not sell me the suit unless I came into the store, so he said, Will you not step inside, sir, while I find out the price of the suit? Of course he knew the price all the time, but that was his way of disarming me of the thought that he intended trying to sell me the suit. Of course I had to be as polite as the salesman, so I said, Certainly, and walked inside. The salesman said, Step right this way, sir, and I will get the information for you. In less than two minutes I found myself standing in front of a case with my coat off, getting ready to try on a coat like the one I had observed in the window. After I was in the coat, which happened to fit almost perfectly, which was no accident thanks to the accurate eyes of an observing salesman, my attention was called to the nice, smooth touch of the material. I rubbed my hand up and down the arm of the coat as I had seen the salesman do while describing the material, and sure enough it was a very fine piece of material. By this time I had again asked the price, and when I was told that the suit was only fifty dollars I was agreeably surprised, because I had been led to believe that it might have been priced much higher. However, when I first saw the suit in the window my guess was that it was priced at about thirty-five dollars, and I doubt that I would have paid that much for it had I not fallen into the hands of a man who knew how to show the suit to best advantage. If the first coat tried on me had been about two sizes too large or a size too small, I doubt that any sale would have been made, despite the fact that all ready-to-wear suits sold in the better stores are altered to fit the customer. I bought that suit on the impulse of the moment, as the psychologist would say, and I am not the only man who buys goods on that same sort of impulse. A single slip on the part of the salesman would have lost him the sale of that suit. If he had replied fifty dollars when I asked the price, I would have said thank you, and have gone my way without looking at the suit. Later in the season I purchased two more suits from this same salesman, and if I now lived in Chicago the chances are that I would buy still other suits from him, because he always showed me suits that were in keeping with my personality. The Marshall Field store in Chicago gets more for merchandise than does any other store of its kind in the country. Moreover, people knowingly pay more at this store and feel better satisfied than if they bought the merchandise at another store for less money. Why is this? Well, there are many reasons, among them the fact that anything purchased at the field store which is not entirely satisfactory may be returned and exchanged for other merchandise, or the purchase price may be refunded, just as the customer wishes. An implied guarantee goes with every article sold in the field store. Another reason why people will pay more at the field store is the fact that the merchandise is displayed and shown to better advantage than it is at most other stores. The field window displays are truly works of art, no less than if they were created for the sake of art alone, and not merely to sell merchandise. The same is true of the goods displayed in the store. 
There is harmony and proper grouping of merchandise throughout the field establishment, and this creates an atmosphere that is more, much more, than merely an imaginary one. Still another reason why the field store can get more for merchandise than most other merchants is due to the careful selection and supervision of salespeople. One would seldom find a person employed in the field store whom one would not be willing to accept as a social equal or as a neighbor. Not a few men have made the acquaintances of girls in the field store who later became their wives. Merchandise purchased in the field store is packed or wrapped more artistically than is common in other stores, which is still another reason why people go out of their way and pay higher prices to trade there.